entering the March 10th, 2020 uh, Planning and Zoning Commission City of Post Falls meeting to order. Will you please join in join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, with that smooth opening, I'll go to roll call, please. Carey? Here. Kimball? Here. Latham? Here. Whelan? Here. Campy? Here. All right. So we have a quorum tonight. Um, just a quick reminder, anyone out there with a cell phone, please silence it or turn it off. Do we have any amendments to the agenda today? Um, no. None? Not. Okay. Do we have any ceremonies, announcements, appointments? I believe we have one. We have one. Um, Laura Whalen was appointed to the Planning and Zoning Commission. So this is her first evening here. Welcome. 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 Came on a great one. Thank you. Yeah, I don't get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So moving on, declaration of conflict. Do we have any conflicts of interest tonight? No. no. Seeing none. Moving on to the consent calendar. We have two items. Yes, we have uh, item A, meeting minutes from 2-11-2020, and B, the reason decision for Elm Road zone change file number RZNE0004-2019. Okay, do I have a motion regarding the consent calendar? I move to approve the consent calendar as um, presented. We have a, a motion. Second. We have a second. Roll call, please. Campy? Yes. Whalen? Yes. Latham? Uh, abstain. Kimball? Yes. Carey? Yes. Moving on, item number two, citizen issues. So this is part of our agenda where citizens can come up to the podium and talk. You've got five minutes to talk about anything that is not on this agenda or on any future agendas. If there's anyone out there who'd like to chat about it, anything, saying none. We will move on to old and unfinished business, which I don't see any on the agenda, which brings us to the meat of our pub, of our hearing tonight, well, public hearings. So we have a the 2020 comp plan update file number CPA 0001-2020. And I'll open the public hearing. Bob's presenting. I'm not presenting, I just wanted to introduce. Um, introducing. Introducing really quick, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so this is for the 2020 comp plan, which the city has been working on for the last few years. Uh, Bill Grimes is here to present the work that uh, they did in cooperation with city staff and his uh, company studio, Cascade and SCJ Alliance. Um, so without, with that, we'll go ahead and bring this up. You're gonna control that. Success. All right. That was satisfyingly smooth in transition. So uh, thank you very much for uh, having me out again uh, to, to speak to you all. Uh, we, um, all right. uh, we have a few things we'd like to touch on tonight. I'd like to give you just a quick overview on uh, some of the policy shifts uh, that we have and then touch on the process. It's been about a three-year process. So uh, I'll take you through a bit about uh, what, what that was. Uh, and then we'll get into what is really new about this plan in terms of strategy. Uh, and then we'll have an opportunity to have some conversation, some Q&A. And uh, I'll let you determine as much time as you'd like to spend, spend on that. Uh, when we looked at the, at the vision for uh, the comprehensive plan, um, uh, we wanted to make sure that we Result, well, that we had, a, had one uh, resulting from the process that was current and was capturing the imagination and the aspirations of the people today. Uh, and we formulated the, the vision around a growth forecast of about 104,000 people within our planning area. Uh, so at some point within the next 20 years, we're looking to grow uh, within our planning area quite substantially and quite significantly. And so we tried to find a vision that would allow us to manage that growth in a way that's consistent with the values of the community. 
Uh, we also saw that uh, as Post Falls has matured over the years, it's become a community that's increasingly diverse in its landscape and its development patterns. And so we wanted to figure out how we could give that voice in the plan as well. Post Falls is not a one-size-fits-all community. It may have been 25, 30 years ago, but it's grown, it's grown beyond that now. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we were laying the groundwork for continued ep economic prosperity uh, while still uh, retaining a sense of small town identity in this community uh, and, and also making sure uh, that, uh, that people in 20 years can see a post falls that they recognize. Uh, there are those things that, that, that endure. So one of the things that came out of this uh, is this uh, context area map uh, that speaks about those variations in character across the various neighborhoods in, in this community. And it not only describes what these different areas may represent or what they may be, but it also provides some high-level guidance on how they may evolve over time. Uh, Post Falls is not a fully built-out community, and so we wanted to make sure that as investment and reinvestment comes into these areas of town, uh, it's sensitive to the patterns that have been created and honors and respects the type of patterns that people would like to see into the future. We felt that this type of uh, context area description really laid a high-level geographic element to the vision that words alone couldn't provide for us. Uh, what, we, what we did with our, with our planning process is that after we, after we got a sense of how the neighborhoods were laying out, uh, we reflected on some of the orientation interviews that we had earlier on in the process uh, and our own evaluation of the code and of the comprehensive plan and identified specific portions of town that probably needed the greatest degree of policy focus. And this is something that emerged as an early version of a conceptual land use plan, one of our early steps to try to create a sense of land use districts and transportation modifications to achieve some of those neighborhood high level characteristics. And then we took a look at the policy that was adopted in the 2010 comprehensive plan. And we found that a lot of what was included in the policy is tracking with a lot of what people were telling us they wanted to see in Post Falls over the next 20 years. They want to make sure that the city is managed in a way that maintains its uh, fiscal position. We want to be a healthy city. We have a sustainable budget uh, for the long haul. Uh, <coughs> there are also uh, expectations about the way the community looks, the way development is designed and managed. Uh, so that we have an aesthetic character in Post Falls. That, that was policy in 2010 and is certainly something that was underscored in this process. Uh, the 2010 plan also introduced the concept of more compact development uh, so that you have, uh, uh, it, it, it's called a granularity or a fine scale character to the development. So we're mixing types of uses uh, at, a, at a smaller, finer level. So it's a little bit more uh, diverse uh, within a, in a smaller area. Uh, and also that plan was talking about managing annexation so they make sense. That we're not necessarily a grow at all costs type of a situation, we're more deliberate in the way we look at annexations. Uh, going one step further, we saw that there, was, there were policy directions in the 2010 plan that were close, uh, but might need some fine tuning uh, to match what people were, were asking for. One was a growth rate, 2010 plan forecast uh, a fairly slow growth rate but we're not seeing that over time. You know, some, some of the levels of growth in the decade from 2010 to 2020 were actually quite high, so we needed to make sure that we had a plan that anticipated that uh, and matched it with a forecast for the future. Um, the 2010 plan also placed an emphasis on what was called the SMART code, which is a zoning strategy, uh, more form-based rather than use-based, uh, but what the city has done to implement that is that it has actually adopted two types of zoning ordinances and it has been difficult to administer. Uh, and so I'm not exactly sure what the city's course is going to be on correcting that at the zoning code level, but we needed to put policy in place so that it would allow that merging of, of, the, zoning, uh, of the zoning strategies. Uh, also the Highway 41 corridor was uh, planned for almost exclusively retail use from I-90 all the way up to Prairie Avenue. Uh, and there was a highway 41 corridor plan uh, that was done prior to the 2010 comprehensive plan, but the 2010 comprehensive plan pulled that policy and put it in there. What we found in our economic assessment going into this project and listening to what people were telling us is that maybe it's time for Highway 41 to have a bit more diversity in its land use development character than what that Highway 41 plan or what the 2010 plan said. Still, 
you know, an active, busy place, but maybe not entirely or exclusively retail as a 2010 plan might suggest. Um, also looking at um, enhancing the level of coordination between the cities of Post Falls, Rathrum, and Hayden with Kootenai County on managing the ACI. Uh, and making sure that the type of strategies we would like to employ for annexation are reflected also in the way we work with our neighbors in managing that unincorporated space as the three cities begin to converge. Um, policy was also uh, rather vague on how we deal with commercial design, so we wanted to find ways that we could encourage higher level of design and commercial projects, uh, and that we also allow for neighborhood commercial centers to develop. Uh, things that are more convenient to the residential areas, uh, particularly in the northern side of town. So people who are in these residential areas have an opportunity to walk uh, to take care of some of their daily needs. Uh, and then we also uh, were responding to needs for uh, trails. People were talking to us about trails, non-motorized access opportunities, not having to use a car to do everything. Uh, and we saw that there were some needs to adjust policy uh, to accommodate that as well. And then there are some things that the 2010 just really doesn't apply anymore. Uh, as, as we've seen subdivisions designed and developed under the 2010 policy guidance, we've seen them fall short uh, in terms of two really very important things that are on the minds of the community. One is connectivity, uh, that we have opportunities for our streets to interconnect more than they do. Um, just a little, little anecdote, uh, I was doing some work for the city of Sammamish uh, and they are a town uh, that has a residential subdivision pattern not necessarily unlike this one, let me phrase that in a positive, quite a bit like this one in that they have uh, roads that, uh, that terminate cul-de-sacs, uh, you know, they're uh, blocks that are enclosed one way in, one way out. Uh, I was talking with their school district as part of writing their transportation plan and their school district puts on four million miles a year on their buses, four million miles a year on their buses. And if they had more connectivity in, in their neighborhoods, if they didn't have to go in, go out, circle out, and come back in, it would cut their mileage by 25%. So some of the things that we're looking to do is enhance that street network connectivity so that we do have plentiful alternate routes to go from point A to point B in this community. We're not trying to channel all of our traffic on our primary arterials. And that is an important component of compactness as well because if you have that kind of network design in your streets, it allows you to have uh, a more compact and more easily managed incremental transition of different types of land uses within the more tightly defined block pattern. Uh, something else that, that uh, needed to, to be brought into the policy component is the, the design of our streets themselves. Um, many, many of our arterial streets here in Post Falls um, have uh, reverse frontage style subdivision, which as this picture shows, uh, backs development onto these arterial streets. And if, if that is happening for maybe three blocks or four blocks, maybe that's okay. But if you're looking at miles of this reverse frontage pattern, you wind up having corridors with fences and walls and really a, a sense of unfriendliness. Fine for cars, but it's not necessarily um, an interesting or comfortable place to walk or ride a bicycle. So ways that we can begin to look at our corridor design a little bit differently so that the corridors themselves feel a little bit more habitable for more than just vehicles. Um, we were also looking to uh, find ways that we could uh, adjust policy so that we could have those smaller scale commercial centers, you know, maybe three or four stores located within an easy walk of a neighborhood rather than really having policy direction that emphasizes the formation of street cor uh, strip corridors or, uh, sorry, strip commercial. Um, or um, big box retail. Uh, we also saw that there was in the 2010 plan a pretty much one-to-one -one correspondence between the comprehensive plan land use designation and the zoning district. And that has been a challenge as the city has tried to find more flexible ways to accommodate development, uh, but the way the city's comprehensive plan is now set up, any real change to zoning that you might want to make must also be accompanied by a comprehensive plan amendment. And that really makes the process much more, um, I think, involved than it might need to be to allow that flexibility. So we were looking to create more generalized land use districts 
uh, and then have the zoning districts that might have three or four different districts within, you know, nesting within a comprehensive plan land use district. And I think that in the commission's conversation about the future land use map, some of that conversation has come, has come up. Um, and then also making sure that uh, we're paying attention to residential design, particularly if we're looking at moving away from the smart code, uh, that we have some policies that uh, allow the city to take a look at residential design, particularly where single family residential adjoins more intense uses so that we can ensure compatibility between multifamily and single family office professional or commercial or industrial or agricultural uses along our single family neighborhoods. Okay, so I'll just touch on some, some of the more specific policies that, that, that you'll see in this comprehensive plan. Um, we're pretty direct uh, about advocating for a clustering and a mix of land uses. So we're not necessarily looking to plan for land uses on 40 acre denominations. We're trying to find ways that we can make it a little bit more interesting in some of these places and we're, we're uh, making policy declarations that are really very clear uh, about doing that. Uh, wanting to make sure that there's a residential landscape that offers a variety of housing type uh, and welcomes that variety of housing types into the mix. Uh, so that we can have single family homes that are detached, we can have single family homes that are attached, we can have town homes, we can have apartments and condominiums, uh, we can have this kind of a variety of housing landscape or residential landscape in, in the plan. Uh, and Post Falls is really very interesting in that you can find examples of all of that throughout the community, but what you don't necessarily see is ways in which they blend effectively together. Uh, they seem to develop in cells, and so what we're looking at here with this policy is providing opportunity for these things to be a little bit more mixed in. Uh, wanting to make sure that our land use policies also emphasize the development of employment uses. Post Falls more and more is becoming an employment center. I was talking with an economist today and he was asking me about where people in Post Falls are working. And you know, based on our analysis, about 50% of Post Falls employees are going into Spokane County to work. The other 50% are either in Post Falls or in Coeur d'Alene. <coughs> So we have more and more employment that's, in, that's increasingly local and, uh, and our, our plan is looking to find ways that we can continue uh, the spinning of that flywheel so we can uh, become an increasingly prosperous community. Uh, and then we also have land use policies that talk about the compatibility, like I was talking about with the residential and the non-residential uses, finding ways that where they are, adjo where they are adjoining, uh, <coughs> the, the non-residential uses are designed and managed in a way that they minimize uh, impacts on the residential neighborhoods. Some of the things about transportation that we're looking at um, in, this, in this policy is that Post Falls still is dependent on the automobile and probably will be for a very long time. And so a lot of our transportation policy really is about moving people in cars. Uh, we're trying to also find ways that we can have policies that move people in things other than cars uh, where they choose to do it. So this is where transportation and land use really intersect. So we have the right kind of character of the roadways to get the right kind of development that we're looking for. Uh, and that we have the kind of proximity uh, of our different types of land uses so that walking or riding a bike becomes an attractive and viable transportation alternative. It's not going to be a sea change necessarily, but at least trying to find ways that we can provide the opportunity for people who don't drive, can't drive, or just wish to do something else. Um, we're also looking at designing ways uh, to be more accommodating of public transportation if public transportation becomes more of a factor in Post Falls. Remember, this is a 20-year look. So we're trying to find ways that we can create patterns now that are going to adapt to our trends and habits 20 years from now. And if we start thinking about public transportation now and how that might interweave in our urban form, uh, we can make some more strategic decisions about the way we arrange our streets and, again, the way we arrange our land uses. Uh, what we've done with this plan that is, a, that is a major change from the 2010 plan uh, is that we've created Appendix B. And I've, uh, I've said that if for any reason you need to make a quick exit from your house and everything is in flames, I don't wish this on, I don't wish this on anybody, but take Appendix B with you. Because <laughs> Appendix B is the bones and muscle of this comprehensive plan. It, 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 dis, it does away with the narrative and the storytelling from the rest of the plan, uh, but it includes all of the goals and policies that will be the things that advise the decisions you make as a commission. It'll advise the budgeting that the city council does. It'll advise the, the decisions that the city officials make on a day-to-day -day basis. 
so Appendix B is really your one single source uh, of, of the comprehensive plan's forward look and, and direction. And we did it for a couple of reasons. Uh, one uh, was because we needed to make sure that the policies that relate to transportation and land use and housing and economic development, capital facilities, uh, are internally consistent. You know, uh, if you take a look at the 2010 plan, <clears throat> you'll find that there are some policies that may not necessarily be 100% aligned with each other. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that by putting the policies in one place, uh, we could guarantee that level of, of internal, internal consistency. Uh, it's also more efficient because if you take a look again at the 2010 plan or if you look at virtually any other comprehensive plan, uh, you'll see that there are policies that deal with land use in the land use chapter, policies that deal with transportation in the transportation plan or in the tra transportation chapter, housing in the housing chapter, and so on. We find that there's a, often a lot of similarity between the goals and policies in the different chapters, but they're just a little bit different. So what we've done is that we've combined those things. So you'll see that a single goal is going to do double, triple, or quadruple duty. So we start talking about the development of the land use pattern that also applies to a transportation objective. So, so we found that, that we were able to reduce uh, quite significantly the number of goals and policies just by putting them all in the same place. And when we start thinking about how we use a comprehensive plan in the future, that makes Bob's job a lot easier because now he can go to Appendix B and say, well, this decision is consistent with guidance from policy one seven, you know, goal one, policy seven. So, so he has that single source that he can go to to give him guidance on decision. And it'll be the same with you. So when uh, things come before the Planning and Zoning Commission for your, your eyes and your recommendation, you'll be able to look at the policies from the staff report that point to this appendix, and you'll be able to see if you agree with that recommendation or not, but it'll be an easier throw for you, and it'll make the City Council's job a lot easier as it's looking at its uh, budget initiatives as well. So I hope, I hope you find it to be, to be a, handy, a handy tool for you, but it's a significant change. Uh, so our process to get here, uh, it's, like I said, it's been about three years. Uh, we started off with orientation interviews. We spoke with about 24 people, just selected them among the community to help bring us up to speed and the issues and the topics that we need to focus our plan on. Uh, we had a studio in the Rotunda. I don't know, Mark, I think you may have attended the studio. I know you were one of our interviewees. But we spent three days here in the studio, also on election day, which was great because we were able to catch people as they were coming in. Uh, we had a series of community workshops, uh, we produced a draft plan for comment. Anyway, so we're at the planning and zoning hearing now. Next step will be on to city council. Our orientation interviews are really kind of fun because not only were we taking notes while people were talking to us, but we were also jotting down ideas on maps so we could begin to see uh, how some of the areas were really aligning from one, one interview to the next. You know, the, inter the interchange at Highway 41, everybody had something to say about that particular issue. And so on our maps, that area was blowing up. Uh, but but the various conversations brought up ideas that we hadn't necessarily thought of before, and we were able to chart them on the map. And, and uh, I don't know if I have another exhibit of it, but you remember that neighborhood context map that was born from a lot of these conversations as people were identifying specific characteristics and specific issues that were uh, showing up in various places. Um, also, John uh, realized that we needed to appoint an advisory committee as part of this. Uh, and so we did that. We had several meetings through the course of the process to see if we were interpreting what we were hearing uh, in line with what this advisory committee would also, uh, would also recommend. Uh, and that helped us with, uh, with our policy recommendations throughout. Uh, we had our three-day studio in the Rotunda, uh, which was really great fun. Uh, we probably had maybe 150 people come through and talk to us in the Rotunda. A lot of them were just here to vote, but we went ahead and grabbed them and brought them over to our tables. Uh, but we, we uh, the, these, these exhibits that you see here were uh, snippets from a vision statement that, were, that now appears in the plan, uh, and we we're trying to figure out how people would react to these various things. How do we deal with, Celt with the Celtus corridor east of downtown? How do we deal with the Celtus corridor west of downtown? Two completely different environments, same street. Uh, how do we deal with the Spokane River? Uh, and so on. How do we deal with the parks and recreation? How do we deal with the prairie? Uh, so people were able to, to give us some comments that really began to focus our policy direction uh, in, in the plan. 
uh, once we uh, once we were able to pull that material together, we produced a draft plan and we had a rollout uh, where we could uh, just test and see how well our ideas were matching with what the community had to say. Uh, we also had an online survey uh, that advanced some of the same ideas uh, from the rollout uh, to see if we were tracking. Uh, and we built up our concept land use map in response. And in that concept land use map, uh, we embedded the thoughts about just the, the physical picture of how our land would develop and also the more functional elements of how we're going to navigate that with our transportation <coughs> system and with our water and sewer systems. Uh, once we got to that level, we went out to uh, uh, post Falls Days. We spent two days, again, speaking to hundreds of people. Great conversations. I was just remembering some of those earlier today. Uh, and uh, we had booth maps. We had, we had questionnaires. We had uh, clipboard flip chart. You know, we had maps. Again, opportunities for us to advance our thoughts, challenge people, and they would make recommendations back to us on how we needed to make it make it better uh, and people were really very enthusiastic but one thing that that was just been uh, a guiding principle for us is making sure again that if this guy shows up he sees a post falls that he that he recognizes uh, that it may not necessarily physically be the same community but at least some of the same values and priorities mm -hmm. uh, upon which the community was founded uh, still still remain so again, uh, the vision is broken down into these types of uh, character areas to give us the, the high level guidance uh, for incremental infill development. And it translated into this future land use map, which I believe just last month or in January, you had a chance to take a look at and vet. So this is incorporated in the draft, uh, in the draft plan at this, uh, at this stage. Um, I told you that there was one more new thing uh, and that's the consideration of strategy. Uh, and what this plan does, not only does it have an Appendix B that is your guideline for how to act for the next 20 years, uh, but it has a strategy chapter that focuses on priority implementation action items near, medium, long term, uh, so that you can actually begin to look at who is going to be doing what and why and how it relates to specific policy initiatives in the rest of the plan. So what we've tried to do with that is give the city council uh, a guide on how to begin budgeting on how to implement some of these comprehensive plan um, actions. Okay, so that's all that I have for you as a presentation. Uh, we have q and A. I am happy to stay up here for as long as you need me. Are there questions? Not yet. I don't know how many how much opportunity we're going to have here. Um, I do want to take the time really quick to point out, I, I forgot to announce to everyone that uh, there are sign-up sheets in the back, on the back table, if you want to come up and talk about this. Um, just throw one out, bring it up to Amber, and then you can have your time to s speak. Um, do we have, do, can you kind of give us an idea of what the plan then would be for, for Highway 41 or, or what collectively that you're hearing that people would like to obviously see not quite so, <coughs> so much um, just commercial mm -hmm. lining it? What would be the alternative to that or what would be mixed in there? What, how do you see that? Yeah, well, I, I, think, I think that what we, what we see nationally is that our retail and commercial land is way oversupplied. And so we need to think of a more creative way to develop that land. Now, unfortunately, next to a, a highway, it's not always a suitable, attractive place to build residential development. So what we're trying to do with this plan is we're trying to provide for parallel, we call them backage roads, but parallel roads that are about an eighth of a mile off of the highway corridor so that we have um, local fo locally focused uh, collector streets uh, that provide for development to front those rather than rely on the highway for access and orientation. So it's also close enough so you still have a chance to see it from the highway. Uh, 
would also but almost there's... be the backs of those buildings, though, wouldn't it? Then would, that would be fronting the highway, or that that you would be looking at when you were driving down the highway, basically. It, yeah, it, it's going to create. It's, it's going to require a certain amount of creative architecture because we are looking to enhance the design experience yeah. along the corridor <clears> itself. <throat> right. So whether it's a combination of landscaping or maybe just some, some creative building design, you know, there's still an element of character. But we're trying to avoid the back of house kind of image right. along, yeah, along Highway 41. Kind of uh, but we still want to make sure that we have uh, an opportunity for flexibility. So, so by creating that, that backage road system that's still somewhat close to Highway 41, we're hoping that we're um, enabling a little bit more flexibility in design. Yeah, that creativity. makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Mark, any thoughts or comments? No, I like, I like the comprehensive plan a lot. I think that the, um, the mixed use zoning is, it is um, <coughs> it's not zoning, but comp plan designation is a nice, it's a nice thing to add because <clears throat> over the years, you know, Ray and I, we always there's too much commercials, too much industrial, and then Celtis doesn't make sense industrial, it doesn't make sense commercial, and it seems like it's always waffling around, and just those that industrial and that commercial zones are so rigid, and um, that opens it up a bit. It's a little bit more flexible and dynamic because. Yeah, the economies as they goes up and down, you have less housing, more housing, less commercial, more house, more commercial, and it always just changes. And then the other the other thing that makes sense is those nodes, the comp plans allow the comp plan allowing some of that flexible zoning in those pockets in the prairie. Because if you're going for a zone change or an annexation, you wouldn't be caught dead asking for a commercial CCS designation when it was surrounded by homes. But that opens the door for mm -hmm. that. And at first, I was a little skeptical or wondering about that. But I, I, I think it does make a lot of sense. You have to look a little, little farther into the future for that one, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I agree. It, it does make sense. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yep. Does the, does the mixed use, does that allow for, um, will that allow for the, um, uh, the mixed use in the new downtown corridor we're trying to work on with um, residential upstairs, business below, mm -hmm. that is a use that's going to be allowed in this mixed use? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's really part of well, the zoning and comp plan. Well, there is the difference between zoning <coughs> and the comp yeah. comprehensive plan. Between and, the two. And the downtown is designated as an area that would be good with that mixed use. Yeah. Um, and uh, while we currently have smart code and there is a uh, request to change that to a different code, we do need to find something that still meets the needs of the mixed use type of development. So, thank you. So, the, so the idea would be to kind of phase out smart code, or that has been proposed, um, and we do need to. I'm, we're going to start having some kind of one-on-one -on -one interviews with some folks that have expressed their their issues with it. We've also have had good feedback on it, so we just need to kind of look at it and where is it most appropriate. Um, because it is a form-based code and typically is best for infill <coughs> development. Um, so, you know, the downtown may be the right spot for it, but we need to kind of sort out what were the issues um, when the when it started arising that there were problems yeah, with it. Because we definitely do have infill still that's sitting out there. It's Correct. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but don't forget this is a comp plan, so it's just the vision, which right. means that if you were wanting to go in and as a zoning change or, or annex, then that's that's what you would want to model it after. Mm -hmm. yep. it. Laura, I know you're fairly just jumping in um, head first, but how any any thoughts or? Thank, thank you. I mean, I did um, have a chance to, to look at the land use plan. I, I appreciate you pointing out um, Appendix B. I think that is a great place to go for a, a, <coughs> a, a quick look, um, and um, appreciate that it gives the, the flexibility. Um, I mean, there's a lot of flexibility in this plan. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Yep. Bill, as someone who uses comprehensive plans on a very regular basis and trying to get zone changes and annexations and things like that through different municipalities. I have a very acute appreciation for what you guys have done and how you've adjusted things for a flexibility. Um, it's unfortunate there aren't as many people here as there probably should be because it's a, this is the, the foundation for pretty much all land use actions in the city of Post Falls for the next 15 or 20 years. Um, yeah. But it is good to know that you have had the, the interactions over the last three years with them. And so maybe that's, that, that's a good sign that 
you know, they don't have to be here, that the, their voice has been heard and incorporated. Um, I, I love the fact that you guys have figured out a great way to add flexibility into the land use designations for the transitions and um, mixed use and things like that that will we'll let land development happen organically instead of trying to force it one way or another necessarily because I think that's one of the problems that we've had in the past is that we've tried to really force things and it's led to lower property values because they just aren't going to develop the way we were hoping they were going to and the market didn't go that way and you know I'm no prognosticator but I do know that in 20 years the market's going to be different than it is today mm -hmm. and that's the one thing I do know so uh, thank you for that um, do we have any other questions or okay. comments regarding this I don't think so Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Amber, do we have any public here public signed up? Does anyone out there want to speak towards this? Seeing none. Um, assume there's no rebuttal from the city, so I will close the public hearing. And we can do some discussion. I think we just had a lot. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> Would we make a motion on this this evening or is it to forward to the city council? Yes. yes. <clears throat> okay. okay. We've had quite a bit of discussion. Does anyone else want to weigh in with regards to this? I think it's very well thought out. How much discussion? Should, I mean, I know we had quite this a bit is, just this recently. Is, just as part of a the purely legislative process for you this okay. isn't a quasi judicial you don't have to make specific findings this is a recommendation for a policy that's going to go forward as okay. you noted uh, acting chairman Kimball I was gonna say vice chair but you're really not the vice chair tonight you're the chairman um, this is not a regulatory document and so as you as the body know and some of you may know better than others um, like a zone change is done by ordinance and you have special findings and a process to pass an ordinance this is not an ordinance because an ordinance is a regulatory document it's the law of the city this is passed by resolution it's just guidance it's the principle having said that which makes it look like it diminishes the importance mr. Kimball was absolutely correct this is the foundation for everything else that comes after First you have your comprehensive plan, then you have your zoning, then you have your subdivision, then you have your more specialized regulations. But everything builds off of this comprehensive plan. And it's not a zoning map, it's not specific requirements, but it's the general philosophical guidance that sets the standard for all the other things that are gonna come later. And so that's really important. Now, having said all that, normally you would make a recommendation to the City Council having said that I believe there's a few changes that need to be made still within this document some housekeeping matters um, and so I can't speak specifically to each and every one of those but I have reason to believe there are a few things out there still and so there may be some modifications some house cleaning matters prior to this going to the council and so at that time they will have another hearing on this matter for interested members of the public it's my understanding at least that's the process that's being contemplated and so um, were that not the case you this body would have the only hearing and then the City Council wouldn't necessarily have to have another hearing but because we've got a few house cleaning matters to address still prior to adoption we will be noticing that for another hearing so all of that gets to the point that I'm trying to get to <laughs> which is I think you'd make a recommendation but within that recommendation I'll include the fact that there's a few changes and I'll, I'll defer to Bob on how to make yeah. the can can you give us the Reader's Digest version of what the changes those might include the ex example is uh, re uh, responding to the comments from Avista uh, Avista did not want their islands listed as part of the community forest they wanted them listed as no access um, you know they also because we had noted that um, 
Cor uh, I believe it was Corbin Park was owned by Avista. They also wanted just to have it noted that Trailer Park Wave, that land was also owned by Avista. So there were just some minor issues that Avista had. Um, they did uh, allow us to leave in there one of the, I believe it was one of the goals, uh, stating that we would continue to work with Avista in the future to potentially someday, maybe, just possibly, gain access to the islands um, as a recreational feature. But they really did not want that in there because they have a tough time with keeping people off the islands. So some of those types of things um, that we are just still cleaning up that they hadn't, the minor edits had not been made yet, um, okay. that the edits had come from um, the last, one of the last meetings that we had had. Um, so those are being updated, um, but had not, are, are going to be updated. So. Okay, but so there's a Vista. Nothing substant, nothing huge. Nothing substant, okay. Those little detail things. Yeah. Okay. Have any more discussion? I don't think so. Uh -uh. So, so I think that probably some language that you can use if you wanted to approve it is to now. Do they need to re recommend approval, or is this like, hey, we approve it based on? They recommend approval. Just recommend to the approval for, to council based on the um, as presented. As presented, and as the minor edits are made. Understanding that there are some minor yes. housekeeping edits mm -hmm. for to happen. Sense. Okay. Look for a motion then. Oh, you can't do it, can you? I can. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you wanted to. But any, I would move to recommend approval of the comprehensive plan, uh, understanding that there are some minor edits, uh, that housekeeping items that will take place between now and the public hearing in front of city council. I would second that. We have a motion and a second. Can I get a roll call, please? Jerry? Yes. Gimbal? Yes. Latham? Yes. Whalen? Yes. Campy? Yes. Okay. Let's see. Let me get back to my agenda here. So on to item number five, new business. Don't see any there. Item six is administrative or staff reports. Bob, nothing there. None tonight, thank you. Any commissioner comments? No, I would comment that I um, look forward to working with you all. We welcome and you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for volunteering your time. Like I said, don't get used to this. <laughs> yeah. Nancy shares it's a rarity. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it is. I could. And I need a hey, Ray. Yes. Um, back on number six. Uh, green, meadows. green meadows. Yeah. So just so you guys are aware, uh, the green meadows decision that had been made here uh, last month, I believe, month before, uh, is being has been appealed to the city council, and that will be heard up there uh, next week. That's Tuesday, right? The 17th. Right, on the 17th. Yep. Okay. 17th. And that was that was that the one with on Killdeer Lane. It was Killdeer. It's the one that had, I believe, five exits onto Killdeer Kill Lane. Yeah. Okay. Or roadway. Yeah. Okay. Network. Four. 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 I thought it was four. Somebody had said five previously. The other one so had five. Kept, oh, oh, the, the one that one you one proved had five. Had five. Yes. Yeah. Got it. Yep. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Uh, anything else <laughs> before we adjourn? No. Now, can I get a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. I second. Adjourn.